Hi everybody, thanks for coming, welcome to our first public event of the spring semester. Um, you may have noticed our lecture poster is now um, posted in the stairwells, which lays out our schedule of events for the next few months. Um, this is a great turnout. I encourage you guys to make this a regular part um, of your weekly routine. I think these events are really carefully organized and special in the way that um, they can help all of you um, understand the variety of ways uh, in which people approach practice and, and even um, think more carefully about how um, the work that they do might resonate with you. And so, again, please make it a, a part of your routine. I think these are great events for the school where, where we can all come together, which doesn't happen that often. Um, tonight, uh, we have two of the four members of TEAM. TEAM stands for Tom, Ellie, Adam, and Meredith. And to my right are Tom and Adam. Um, they're also teaching a visiting critic studio here. Um, they're responsible for the green screens in the back right of the VC space. I encourage everyone to pop back there and see what they've been up to. Um, they're doing really exciting work um, that I think will also be reflected in the projects that they share tonight. Um, Tom and Adam, along with Ellie and Meredith, teach at the University of Michigan, where they've been since 2008, 9? 9. Um, they are tenured associate professors. Um, they're two people I know very well. I've worked together with both of them in a variety of capacities. Over the year, I think uh, very highly of the work that they do, which again, you'll see tonight. Um, maybe just a, a, a brief background to um, depict the context in which this work is created. Uh, the four of them each had independent, independent design practices, probably from maybe even before they finished grad school in the late aughts, um, up until about 2015 when the four of them came together to prepare a proposal to represent the United States in the Venice Biennale in 2016. Um, that was, I think, the first formal collaboration of the group. And I think um, for me and my peers, including Tom and Adam, I think it really represented an important shift in thinking about collaborative practice and also the way in which practices can fold in a, a variety of influences and references and values, and I think their work, uh, because of that, really um, uh, has broad appeal. There's, there's aspects of their work that um, I think builds upon the individual areas of expertise that the four of them developed individually, and uh, it produces projects that are incredibly layered um, and deep, I think, in, in their meaning, in their visual appeal, in their intellectual prowess. Um, and since that time, since 2016, they've done a number of projects that um, I think continuously expand upon the convergence of those interests and, and most recently um, has landed in Detroit where, where some of their commissioned work exists now and where they have uh, really the first opportunities to put more permanent marks in the world. Um, a lot of the stuff that preceded that, the projects that they're working on now are temporary installations, pavilions, conceptual projects, um, individual academic exercises, etc. And um, I, I really admire the work that they've assembled. I think it, it represents a very um, strong commitment to a particular series of interests around materiality, figuration, visuality, image making, digital visual exchanges. Uh, and again, I think all of that is happening in their studio and will be reinforced in their work tonight. So I'm, I'm very happy Tom and Adam are here. They're friends. I admire their work. They're respected colleagues. I hope you feel the same way after viewing the lecture tonight. Um, please help me welcome Tom and Adam. Well, thank you, Kyle, for that really generous uh, introduction. And thanks to Dean Speaks for inviting us here, both for the visiting critic position um, and for the lecture tonight. Uh, there are seats up here. All, there are a lot of people standing. Um, you don't fight, I promise. Um, yeah, I wanted to start by just maybe explaining the title of our lecture. So IRL is something I'm sure you all know what that means in real life. Um, and for us, what we want to talk about today is the transition that we're making right now, or we've been making for the last six years, from being 
uh, an academic practice who's like really interested in speculation and kind of experimental work to a practice that's more driven by client uh, work and like really you know, focus on building. Um, and so yeah, in the, in the spirit of the collaborative efforts of all four of us, when we were talking about this idea of like how to frame the lecture, Meredith was like, well, what's unique about what, how we're doing it? You know, like lots of practices go from speculation to building practice. Um, so I think what we're gonna try to do tonight through a series of projects is trying to answer Meredith's question, which is like, what's unique about the way that we're moving from speculation um, into actually uh, building some buildings? I think it's also related to the studio, which we'll touch on at the end if, if we have time. Um, we show this image a bit on the right. This is a material mock-up from Menards. Do you guys know what Menards is? Some, some, some Hans comes from Menards. Menards is like a, a more regional kind of big box construction um, store in, in the Midwest. Um, we, I think it was Ellie originally that was at Menards and took this photo. Basically, this is a material mock-up which is trying to show the way you would use this window well on the left, which is a steel window well that has an image of stone, uh, probably on the final, that's uh, adhered to the surface of the corrugated metal. Um, and so that's interesting to us in the way that image physical material comes together to produce something new. But on the right, when they're displaying it, they're also kind of just making, I don't know who's making choices, somebody that works for Menards is making choices about what of these materials they're using that they would just use as a material, like there's a two by four, there's polystyrene installation. And then on the left, the stone image is an image of CMU that's printed on like foam board and attached to it. Um, and then another material to the right, the kind of dapple one that you can buy, which is a plastic sheet, which is also embossed to look like stone. So this is for us evidence of a different attitude towards material where it's no longer like maybe physical, authentic materials and some kind of less authentic copy. It's just a range of materiality that moves from digital to physical, image to material, and that's really a realm that we spend a lot of time working in uh, as a practice. Oh, sure. We're gonna scroll through our slides. Um, we try to calibrate the speed so no one gets nauseous or bored. <laughs> you guys tell us. Uh, so this is the project that Kyle mentioned. This is um, done in 2016 for the Venice Biennale. The call was for, well, actually, I don't, the call was just, do you want to be in the Venice Biennale? And I said, <laughs> yes, the framework of the curators was taking four sites in Detroit. Um, these are all sites of buildings that were in um, disuse or disrepair. Detroit is well known for its blighted buildings. There's buildings like this one here. Ours was the Packard plant that are all over Detroit. Um, they're circulated on the web. Um, it's often a term that's used to describe this as ruin porn. Um, so we were assigned uh, the Packard plant, which was a automotive factory that was active from the end of the um, like late 1800s through mid 20th century. Packard was a auto like cars. Uh, it was also a site of production during the uh, World Wars. They produced jet engines here, but it's been abandoned for decades and sadly is about to be torn down, I've heard. Um, it was a site of like rains in the 90s. It's kind of an iconic place for disused buildings in Detroit. So we were assigned this, um, sorry, maybe go up. Hang tight here for a second. Um, maybe on the materials. So maybe to Tom's question. So we were assigned this site and we were, we were actually just assigned a site, not given a program or anything. So it's like, pack a plan, big building. Like, what do you think we should do? Future of architecture. The show is called The Architectural Imagination. 
And it, it was essentially about how can architects imagine futures from these sites. Um, so back to Meredith's question that Tom just mentioned, which is like, what is unique about the way in which we try to approach this work or we're navigating this transition from speculative to built work? Our first initial reaction was wanting somehow to work with the materials themselves. So we're a firm that we're very tactile. We started by making things, lots of material experiments. We don't work a lot through abstraction. We want to do things that are like physically kind of tangible and immediate. Um, so it's a little bit of a challenge when you're giving us, this is a huge building and a huge site. So it's, how do you start working on it? So what we did is started to, yeah. That, that test fit. We'll just do, we'll just multitask. Um, so what we did is we started to like uh, literally gather materials from the site um, and kind of intuitively like digitally scan them. Um, we were doing lots of photogrammetry scanning, working in digital processes, and trying to think about the relationship between the two. Uh, and we started to do things like this. This is also building on some uh, work that Tom had been doing, and then Tommy Meredith working with post-consumer plastics and melting them, and in this case, grinding up brick from the site, and then making this new kind of almost concrete material. And we just started to experiment very directly with the materials themselves. Like that was our entry point. That's what we knew. That's what we wanted to start with. And then we would work with them and try and get controlled about it, both in terms of like, let's say size of aggregate, but also the material qualities themselves, colors, textures, etc. Um, a little bit about the site itself. So the Packard plant was designed by Albert Kahn, who's a famous modernist architect based in Detroit. Uh, his brother was an engineer, Julius Kahn, and they innovated a lot of building technology at this site. So it's the first factory built with reinforced concrete. So we did a lot of research into that, and we were inspired by, um, in many ways, the building itself was a kind of experiment for construction technology. Um, they built it as a series of floors, and some of the areas are built for like a six-story building, but it was only built to two, so they um, embedded all this like rebar in it so that it could grow in the future. So we started to think about, in the spirit of our new material, um, which is using disused, valueless materials. Um, how can we think about a, a way to assemble them that would work um, kind of away from like efficiency and thinness and optimization, some of the paradigms of material and building technology today, towards thickness. Like if they're using material which people are throwing away, maybe you can think about thickness and abundance in a, in a different way. So we started to think about big kind of masonry chunks um, stacking up. Uh, and then we developed that as a series of building typologies that we gave pet names to. This one was called the mountain. So we proposed to like cast big giant bricks, put them together with a crane like a 3D puzzle. This one was a cast in place kind of monolithic shell that again would be a mix of plastic and uh, kind of building rubble cast around a portion of the existing uh, factory. This one was another one where we would cast inside of the column and slabs of the original building. Um, throughout this, we're experimenting, just trying to build on the starting point of physical materials. What became both necessary, but then also uh, line of inquiry or research that we continued forward into our practice was how to represent those materials. So we started with digital scans, but then when it came to drawings, we had to figure out ways of representing those materials in drawings. So how do you kind of capture and uh, maintain those material qualities in the image? So again, we were doing lots of photogrammetry scanning, Photoshop, like layering, kind of materials, an image of materials into one representation so that they would get really blurry. Can I open it for a second, Adam, too? Like, um, I think if you go up a couple of images to like the elephant, you're calling it, you know, the way we started to represent things is we were always prototyping 
um, with materials, and then we would start to make photogrammetry scans of like the failed tests, and then those things would show up as 3D models that would then get rendered back out. And we also had like interns piling up rubble and garbage on the ground <laughs> and just making photogrammetry scans of that that then would be brought into the images. So it was like constant feedback between making a model, making a material mock-up, and then uh, you know, rendering it back out. So it was a constant feedback. The program was also up to us. This is the site in total. And what we ended up proposing is uh, the Detroit Reassembly Plan. So reassembly being the name of the approach to using materials and reassembling them into something new. So we proposed a uh, plant, a factory that would be dedicated to that. So on one end would be materials coming in, then some sorting, some testing, and on uh, the far end, uh, institute dedicated to construction research. And the model, again, so we're sort of resist resisting abstraction, trying to propose and build a model as realistically as possible. So we built the model how we would imagine the building itself being built. So we cast it in the way that we imagined they cast. We crushed up brick and concrete and that became the kind of ground. Um, you know, there's no, um, there's very little abstraction in this, um, except for kind of like select moments on like the side of the uh, side of the model base. But also then it became this sort of um, generator of visual and the texture based effects. So we were exploring that and that also informed future work. Yeah, the whole model, you know, it's gigantic. I don't think they have an image of the overall model in here, but it was designed to have photographs taken of it, you know, maybe obviously, but it was also designed to almost be experienced as a photograph when you're there in the space with it. So, you know, the images you just saw are all kind of composed views that you could see from one side of the model across to the so it's like we we're right from the start just thinking about the scenography that you could build in the kind of any representation of that. Yeah, I'll pick it up here. Um, this is a project that's currently under construction. You can see a construction photo here. It's also in Detroit. Um, it's on East Jefferson, which if you're familiar with, um, Detroit is on the east side, you know, near the lake. Um, we called it Building in a Building. Um, in order to explain it, I think I'll need to explain a little bit of backstory. Um, so the clients are uh, this couple, the Curisons, um, and they are a rare combination of real estate developer and art gallerist. So they have a gallery um, that is known in Detroit, well it's known for both bringing underrepresented artists from Detroit to the global art scene and vice versa, bringing um, internationally renowned um, you know, artists to Detroit to do things in the unique context that is Detroit. It's called the Library Street Collective. You know, and they just, you know, a couple years ago they had it's an architecture dude, oops, it's an architecture dude, you know, a, a brick uh, facade piece, you know, at, the, at their gallery. But they also have, they also organize pieces like this, right, where they have these, like, amazing things built into the amazing spaces around Detroit. So, just, you know, want to point out, very unique client situation. Um, and in the same neighborhood as the project that we're working on, um, they have a kind of larger vision for the project in the neighborhood. Um, they bought a cathedral off the Catholic Church and they're developing um, a bunch of properties around it into a kind of like nexus of art and culture in this part of Detroit. And they've commissioned, um, you know, people like PRO from New York, who you're probably familiar with, um, and you know, a local architect-ish um, to do these kinds of like pretty extraordinary renovations to the church and, um, you know, changing uh, the existing like residential architecture um, with some kind of smart additions to it. So this is the Good Shepherd, that you know church they bought off the 
Catholic Church. And here's our site over here. So it's on the main street, but it's a kind of satellite to the, the larger campus that they're developing in this neighborhood. Um, but they asked us to track head problems. There we go. Um, so they partnered with um, another client who uh, he kind of runs a chain of high fashion um, sneaker, like streetwear <laughs> stores. Um, and they decided to like partner with this guy and he uh, wanted to develop this property into just like more retail space like on this main drag in Detroit. Um, and so that's what we were charged with. And this was the condition of the building um, when, when they contacted us. So basically what they wanted to do is just take this building um, and fix it up. They wanted a basketball court because the client, you know, his streetwear stores always have a component that's a, you know, a um, community center, a nonprofit. Um, and so this, this is basically what they asked us to do, um, which we were pretty, you know, maybe unenthused about doing. Um, so after looking at uh, the project and the site a little bit more closely and thinking about the kinds of issues that we were interested in, you know, the, maybe a different approach to um, adaptive reuse rather than just like fixing up the existing shell, um, you know, putting the basketball court next to it. Um, what we proposed to do was to keep all of the existing elevation, um, which all the clients really loved. You know, it's this, it's this like yellow brick that actually comes from Ontario, um, and you know, a smaller retail space back here. And we could just gut the rest of the building, which was in horrible disrepair, um, and build a new building in a building, um, and slide it over. And instead of the basketball court being a kind of outside uh, afterthought, it would become the centerpiece of the building and the space. And so what it is now, it's like the, the um, streetwear shop and community center are the kind of anchor tenant here. Um, there's gonna be a little like cafe or restaurant here. This will be a space where you know, the restaurant can expand to, um, there'll be events, and then there's you know, a half-court basketball court, as well as uh, three other retail spaces. And the client is really um, keen on supporting like, black entrepreneurs, and so he's actually planning to subsidize some of the rents to get some um, local small businesses off the ground. Um, so here's some renderings of it, um, of the design. But you can see, of course, we're very interested in just the like raw materiality of the inside of the building. So the contractor especially has been confused um, for a lot of the process because um, we're almost more interested in the back of the facade um, than the front of the facade. Um, so these renderings don't do the materiality of it justice, which I'll get to in a second. Oh yeah, so <laughs> bringing the Menards image back. This just happens to be a um, demo of some ethos that was on the surface of one of the uh, parts of the building. Um, I just love the visual rhyme between these two. You know, like we're tearing all this stuff off. Um, it just happens to have a similar vibe. So here, here are some um, demo photos. So this is with you know the the roof um, and the interior partitions um, taken down. Um, you can start to see the like character of the inside surfaces, you know, piles of bricks, um, and then these these kinds of conditions, which we really fell in love with. So, again, I think the the contractor is a so, sometimes like it doesn't understand that like we want to keep this like this kind of raw materiality and the registration of different materials and different operations on these surfaces over time is something we really wanted to reveal and express and like uh, celebrate rather than just like, you know, go back over with new brick. Um, so um, the, you know, of course, like anything, I think in all transparency, like we thought this was this brilliant diagram and actually the contractor was really excited once we presented this to him because he's like, oh, now I don't have to like repair this terrible roof. Um, staging will be so much easier. Like demo is gonna be way easier and he was actually pretty, into it because it was going to save him a lot of time and money. Um, but of course, as we start to like try to save this elevation, um, 
as they were trying to repair it and save it, it just like started falling apart in different ways. Um, but actually, we were pretty excited by it in the end because it allowed us to like intervene on the facade with some different um, with some different approaches to saving it. So one is just you know like putting new steel in there and we're bracing it in different ways, um, you know repairing it where we can. Um, but then we weren't going to be able to save this part of the elevation, but you know. The, Obviously, key to the concept is this elevation forms you know, a wall to the street and a room against the new building. Um, and so the client was really keen on like old marquee style signs, you know, from the original era of the building, you know, like the 20s. And so we just proposed to take the technology you would use to like technology, take the you know the forms and materials, you know, a sign maker to make a lighted a backlit sign. Um, we just installed that is a kind of light box that will signal the entry to the space um, and kind of fill in that gap in the wall. Also important to the project is, um, it, for the project was commissioned um, a mural by the artist Nina Chanel Abney. Um, and so the whole um, courtyard um, with the basketball court, you can see the painting in process here, has been painted with an original commission by Abney. Um, so there it is currently under construction. So, I mean, the um, difference between like construction and demolition photos on this project are, you know, a little confusing in a way that I think is exciting to us, but here's like more or less, you know, the most recent photos we have, and then just the sort of interior of the um, interior of the new retail space. Maybe one thing to add on, just to try to answer the question we posed to ourselves oh, yeah, at yeah, the yeah, beginning. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, there's a way in which the Detroit reassembly um, plant uh, allowed us to think, like the speculative context of that work allowed us to ask questions about how you would approach an old building, how you would use parts of an old building, that it wouldn't be wholesale restoration, which you might get in some approaches of adaptive reuse, and it definitely wouldn't be like, you know, getting rid of it and starting over, but there's some odd combination of old and new. And so the Detroit Reassembly Project, we're really testing that out in multiple scales, multiple typologies. And I would say that like that helped us approach this project, like again, going back to the beginning where it was just the original building that they were proposing we rehabilitate, we were like, no, <laughs> like, or, you know, what about this? Or, so I think that just like our own architectural imagination is uh, set up by the field of possibilities that we think design can bring to a project like this is expanded by the speculative work uh, that we were doing earlier. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I think it is also key to point out that like clients, like all clients, contractor, like everyone's been excited by this instead of saying no. You know, like we went into that like. Basically, they asked us to rehabilitate this building, and we came to them and were like, let's do this, it's gonna be more expensive, but better, and they all said yes. I mean, so, you know, to their credit, it was kind of, it's been a kind of an amazing process. So, actually, I forgot to mention the, that first image I showed of like the glass house filled, you know, the, with stone around it, like, the contractor who's building this project is also the contractor who builds those kinds of things for the curists around Detroit, so like, can really achieve a high level of finish and detail, and just kind of up for weird stuff, um, which you know, was helpful to us. Um, so the next project I want to talk about is, um, so we're going kind of like speculative, uh, you know, IRL, or like speculative um, client driven here. So the, the next project is a more speculative project from 2017, we were asked um, to contribute something to the Chicago Architecture Biennial. Um, it's a project called Ghost Box. Um, so some context is the theme of the biennial in 2017 was make new history. And so um, they asked each of the contributors to easily cite some precedents, you know, and provide images as like things that, you know, were informing the work or like what kind of, you know, history did you want to create with the type of work you were making. Um, so I want to talk about the the, the context there a bit. So, you know, uh, little, little known fact, the way we actually got started collaborating 
um, is that we started an Emilio Ambaz reading group, the four of us. <laughs> That's how we came together. We were reading, because we were all kind of fascinated by Ambaz, but like didn't really understand his work. Um, I mean, there's a lot to unpack with Ambaz I'm not going to get into now. Um, you know, but self-indulgent, but also brilliant. Um, but we were really just interested in the way Ambaz was able to combine um, like just multiple scales of um, operation all at once, like no distinction between kind of like landscape, building, furniture, um, but then you know sort of the sort of like the complete thought of like space and material, um, but also didn't shy away from reference, image, um, you know, like so. So that was like the start of the team figured you know showing up in the. Um, references that we have made for the biennial, but also, you know, pretty obviously, we're influenced by um, James Wines and like, Sight and the best stores, and the best product showrooms, especially, just in the way that he like so boldly just uh, depicted, um, you know, uh, the new the the new world that was being built in the suburbs, like in decay, in like different states of decay or disrepair. Um, and, you know, but I think like what, we're fascinated, what was fascinating to us is like both the kind of material reality of it. It wasn't like a joke that, that was, a, you know, light, lightly done. Like, you know, bricks were epoxied into place to produce these very specific effects. Um, and so I think that's what we were fascinated by, you know, obviously our commitments to like, the reality of material and how it creates images. Like these, you know, uh, the best stores, the best product showers were known um, for this kind of attention uh, to the material to produce the images. Um, and the last, the last image that we uh, included was the Indiana Avenue House by Frank Gehry. Uh, just the way that the raw framing and the construction of a building could be exploited, uh, you know, to create the, the, the finishes and the um, feeling of the interior of a building. So it's basically like, almost becomes ornament, you know, just the kind of raw quality of the construction site. Um, and so all of this adds up to, um, or all of this like led us to want to think about the post-retail context, you know, it was almost like uh, anticipated by uh, the work of site. You know, we all know that you know, the suburban context that's, or this, you know, the suburban sprawl and the way that America's been urbanizing for decades is like unsustainable. And we've already seen, um, you know, big box development and those sort of, um, these large scale structures um, already go into disuse and disrepair. Um, and in fact, in commercial retail, there's a term for these like abandoned big boxes and they call them ghost boxes. And so this was a jumping off point for us, which was like, how could we um, take this kind of post retail condition and instead of just try to think of it um, as like reprogramming a big box, you know, as a church or a daycare, but take a similar approach that we did with the Detroit reassembly plan and think about it as, okay, it's a, it's a pile of materials, you know, it has a very clear materiality, it has a clear um, you know, volume and spatial experience, and so like, what is that reality that we can work on and not just think about it as an empty shell um, to be reprogrammed, but you know, as, a, as a material architectural experience to be offered. So, another thing that's happening here, so we talked about in the Detroit Reassembly Plan, um, were the context of the exhibition, we were asked to produce a model and drawings or images, right? And so the model we're building in a similar way, the drawings are where we're like photogrammetry scanning and producing all of these interesting blurriness between materials and their representation. So here we tried to like, we only built a model and we tried to literalize the images. So we're no longer using the image of materials um, as a representation like layered into a drawing, we're actually proposing that image becomes a building material in the space itself. So you'll start to see um, a proposed like large canvas that would be printed with large scale imagery. The imagery itself is produced by 
uh, photographing materials of the model and then printing them, which we would imagine to be photographs of the building materials printed at full scale. Um, I'll show some more images of that in a second. This is the plan, so because there's a idea that you don't need to program it to the same level as before, that there's some empty space that you can work with. So the right side was um, demoed and opened up to be like an open air park. And then on the left hand side, we thought of like a loose aggregation of like residential um, with some like shared services here. Um, we talked about this as like a landscape or an interior landscape, which you'll see kind of like show up in some of the um, images of the model. So also maybe something a little bit different or definitely related to the Detroit reassembly plant was the representation of the building itself kind of in a state of change, right? So we have this area here where the materials themselves are being disassembled from the building, sorted on site, and then repurposed uh, to reconstruct the building. So representing the project itself also sense of time and, and um, sort of like change embedded in it. Um, the site references became something that stuck with the project as a homage of sorts, um, but thinking about these eroded openings, which again are, are very uh, iconic site approaches to apertures. This is the open air kind of park, so we excavated one corner, this is the kind of monumental stair, and this is maybe more where the Umbaz references show up. Um, this is the opposite side next to the piles of materials. So we proposed these large scale like tarps that would produce like loose coverings and then those tarps would be photographed and then large scale imagery of those tarps would be printed as a flat material that would be part of it too. So, you can start to see the cycling through of digital and physical materials that Todd was mentioning. Again, that was part of the representational approach for the Venice project here becomes like literalized in, in a way or proposed as, a, as an actual material for the building. These are some of those like tarps that were you know, painting, um, photographing, photogrammetry scanning, and then producing these images which are meant to these are the planes which divide up the domestic space, so they start to produce like a mountain range. So we started to talk about a new sort of exterior, interior landscape, maybe like a new kind of nature or something like that. Uh, these are some of the piles of rubble that get captured as image and then printed on large tarps that again would be a physical backdrop in the space itself. partially excavating part of the roof to let in sunlight. And then here you start to get the idea of the layering. So we have the physical pile of materials, the image of those piles printed on tarps, um, these kind of blankets hanging from the roof, images of those blankets printed on these planes, which are going to produce these mountain-like profiles. Um, so again, you start to collapse these different materials and their mediation in like one one approach to materials or in one building. And these were the sort of like provisional sleeping pods that were arrayed throughout the domestic landscape. Um, more apertures. So, and then this is also a site reference where we just took the best sign and, and put our initials in there. And then this is a totem of disused materials that is in a pond and produces this sort of monument in the corner. Okay, so this is another project that's nearing uh, construction. I mean, it just looks like a picture of a ceiling, but it is. Uh, so this is a performance space at Dartmouth College. Um, it's an existing corner of a building. Um, it's about 3,000 square feet. It was used as like an entrepreneurial hub. Uh, now it's turning into a space for teaching and performance in the sonic arts. 
And so a lot of it is infrastructure. Uh, when you're dealing with sound, you need to make the space super quiet. So we ripped out all of the HVAC, and it's a lot of like putting in new HVAC, putting in the infrastructure for sound. Um, and I would say looking for opportunities to make that the project or to aestheticize all of that infrastructure. So this is the ceiling, which we painted silver. Um, and then our intervention is a lot of uh, Unistrut, which is all probably around the building if you start looking at it. It's in every building. Um, just this kit of parts, metal, steel, uh, assembly system that is used by all sorts of trades. So we propose to gut the building, paint it all monochrome, so it's various textures of gray on the floor, wall, and ceiling, and then silver on top. So a lot of it is about making choices of how to approach that. But like in, like in the building in a building project where we're telling the contractors to leave the raw materials as is, there's a lot of that happening here. So this was a wall that would had a bunch of uh, wood panels glued to it over plywood. They ripped it all off. There's a bunch of glue still stuck on the wall. They're like, what should we do? And we're just like, yeah, just paint it gray. Um, and I think there is a way in which throughout the work is maybe trying to change, let's say, the aesthetic register of, of these um, approaches to building. So there's lots of instances like that where the contractor is like, there's a big hole in the wall, what do we do? Just, just leave it. And I think there is a way in which um, certain design choices can render these qualities anew, like give them a different, maybe contemporary design uh, valence, let's say, or bring them into a, a contemporary aesthetic. And, you know, it's cheaper, it's less labor, uh, but I think it doesn't happen without intention. I think there's lots of choices uh, one needs to make. Uh, this is a rendering of the project, what it's moving towards, a little bit of an earlier version of it. So lots of infrastructure for staging, sound. Um, there's some textured floor paint on the ground. This is an overhead of a slightly earlier version, but what, um, these two, two zones which are defined by this Venus strut system and then a ring of polycarbonate panels. This is a photograph from about a week ago. So there's this textured gray paint that wraps up the walls and this liner of Venus strut and then this kind of ring of uh, lights that are controlled both by the, um, well, by the controls in the room but also by an artist and the lights can also like change with the sound. But again, like looking for opportunities to aestheticize the sort of like raw infrastructure of the space and making that the identity of the project. And then just some nice moments. So like this is that textured paint on the floor, which wraps up. So it's like a textured concrete paint. And then we wrapped it up in one of the rooms all the way to the, uh, like over the window mullions. This is a collaboration with uh, Stock Studio and Xavi Aguirre. Here's an example again of that, um, the like let's say aestheticization of demo or something like that, where we had to rip this open to figure out some sound stuff, like there was some vibration that was happening. The client is like listening to every tiny little sound and asking for silence. So ripped it out and like, oh, that looks great. Like, let's just leave it and paint it silver. Uh, so again, this becomes like the identity of the project in many ways. Or like, leave the wires. Yeah, so something important to note about this project um, you know, we made a we made a very conscious decision to stop like doing speculative work, but also to like stop self-performing work. You know, we just have said no to installations and exhibitions, um, anything where we're going to have to like go and build it ourselves. We've been 
studiously avoiding and trying to shift to like much more of a professional practice model. Um, so in this project, you know, it was designed with this Unistrut system, which you know, like Adam mentioned, very familiar to lots of trades, electricians, you know, mechanical contractors. Um, so we thought this is going to be great. Like we can do this, you know, interesting aesthetic thing with um, this off-the-shelf system that you know tradespeople are very familiar with. Like nobody would touch it. <laughs> you know, nobody wanted to work with the Unistrut in a way that they were not familiar with. Um, and so the bids kept coming in very high because, you know, the, the contractors wanted to communicate they were not interested in doing this. So ironically, we just decided it would be kind of fun and we'd get uh, better quality control by like just going and doing it ourselves. So we're like, we're the ones installing the stuff that the contractors are very good at installing. But anyway, so as part of being on site, we've got to make a lot of great decisions. Some of the stuff Adam's mentioned about just seeing what it looks like when you pull up at a wall, you can be there and respond to it. But also, just like documenting the way that the architecture just starts to get used by people. Um, so this is, you know, one of the ambitions of the project was to make this open system. Students, you know, are going to be in there and clamping speakers, the things, and lights and things. So the whole thing is meant to be kind of open system. And the contractors were already kind of using it that way. So it's like, the, what you know, the electricians are putting spools of wire, uh, leaving wrenches like in the ceiling. Um, or this one, I love just like using it as a rack to put things on. Um, and what I think, what I like about these images too, um, is something that we didn't really mention with the Detroit Reassembly uh, plan, which is, you know, we, we actually really try to avoid putting people in our images, but usually like to show um, like the sense of inhabitation or use or occupation. Um, through the stuff that you might find there uh, that would imply a certain kind of use or a certain occupation in the space. So these, I think, you can kind of see the people that would be there. Oh yeah, okay. All right. Um, so Living Picture is the last project um, we're going to talk about. So this was um, a project that we, we won a competition in 2017 to design a temporary theater for an artist colony in the suburbs of Chicago um, called Ragdale. And the call is basically, they used to have this um, theater built into the landscape there um, in the teens where you can see it's like a sunken ring. Um, and uh, here I'll show you the image, it's easier. Sunken ring, there's a little um, stage here, and then the wings are made by these trees. And so, you know, the, the, the people who lived at this estate would do performances in the summer, and there was pageantry, and you know, apparently the costumes were still there until a couple of years ago. Um, but basically, the competition asks um, young architecture practices to reimagine the ring as a temporary theater for the performances and other events that happen at the um, artist colony um, in the summer. Um, and so we, it's, it's called Living Picture, which is you know, a literal translation of the French uh, tableau vivant, which uh, you know, is a practice of recreating sometimes historical, um, sometimes biblical uh, uh, um, events um, with live human figures and other props and scenography, and, um, but like completely still. So people would just like stand still <laughs> and be observed. So, uh, so like living picture is the you know, literal translation like I mentioned. And so we were interested in, um, we were interested in this concept of like, how could things that were alive, you know, be um, still be rendered, um, be rendered like a part of the scenery. Um, so here's an image of it from the back. Um, we'll explain how it gets made. Um, so the way we approached it was to make a rhino model of the original, like make a 3D model of the original based on the documents that we had. Um, and so what we wanted to do was basically take um, images of that uh, model of the original, take a series of forms, um, that would uh, inf 
fight and uh, you know sitting the stage backdrop you know all this sort of programmatic shade uh, all the sort of programmatic needs would be met by this assembly of objects and then we would project that imagery over these forms so that from different vantage points you would begin to see the image of the original um, come you know come together uh, as they were cast over all the different objects um, interestingly uh, you can see um, how that works here so anything that was in the kind of shadow of an image got the kind of green uh, transparency grid of you know Photoshop then you can see where the images get painted over um, from different vantage points and where they don't show up um, so you get the shadow of the images and it also just happens to look kind of like a, um, a uh, picnic blanket um, so you can see here for example um, the image of this column is kind of painted from one vantage point so it would align um, if you were in a very specific place on the lawn and so um, in the early days of the opening, we would actually find people like traipsing back and forth, you know, around the around the lawn, just like trying to find those satisfying alignments, like that and that, or this and that. Um, and so, you know, the the project was you know, a way to kind of like make physical these images, uh, but also like get the you know someone to participate physically with their body in, in um, a digital image. And one thing, oh man, I forgot to mention Kristen's space and Reed's space. All right, I've got to go back. Like, so I think like the studio that we're teaching right now, I'm calling uh, green space, screen space. Um, but I think like the fact that we need to come up with language like that goes back to this project and even made it back to the Detroit project, the Detroit reassembly plant. Because like when we were, we had our team working on this project, we would, we kept talking about the, the design of the project or like some moment in the project and it just became unclear what we were talking about because they were both rhino models, right? So we were like in the rhino model. Well, like which rhino model? Are we in the rhino model of the original or are we in the rhino model of our proposal upon which we're going to texture map um, renderings of the original? And so um, we had two, um, you know, intrepid interns working for us uh, Kristen was modeling this, and Reed was modeling this, and so we, we developed a shorthand like Kristen space and Reed space, because it was the only way we could like put a label on the two kinds of computer models that we were overlapping. Um, and so I think like that, that like need to distinguish, I think, between different kinds of representational space, <laughs> you know, I think points to the kinds of interests that we're committed to and work through in our work. So, um, you can see it here um, in action, uh, the performance there, section through it here. Um, Maybe one thing to add is, especially for our students, is that that diagram is simplified. We actually projected renderings of a historical theater from three vantage points, yeah, which yeah. corresponded to the three main entries of the site. And I think what's important for us, like with anamorphic projection, which you guys probably know is the like, effect of having this one primary vantage point where everything comes together that's distributed in space. For us, it's important that there were three and that actually people were moving. Like it's not meant to produce this vantage point which is only singular and got you get from one point, but actually that you're encouraging people to move like as you know embodied subjects through the space and try to make some of these connections. And I think that's something that goes through all of us, all of our work even the like, representational thing, it's not to be a less authentic copy of some real chunk of concrete or something like that. We're, we're very earnestly um, committed to a project of making like embodied experience like more real, <laughs> more engaging by um, accessing uh, this broader range of materiality and qualities that we now work with every day, digital, physical, um, material, etc. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, I think we we joked throughout this project that our goal was to be like the first people to build a rendering, you know, <laughs> like that. Uh, you know, we were just going to try to you know, like take these or multiple renderings from different you know vantage points. But um, no, it's a good point. Like we didn't want it to be a kind of static kind of uh, trick, you know, a cheap trick, like you would see it from one vantage point. But yeah, engaging it from 
many different angles. Um, so just a quick, I know we're like running short on time. We, we made it out of um, awnings, basically. So we were able to like use an awning contractor to make these shapes and then print um, all the imagery on vinyl um, and assemble them all on site there. Um, yeah, you can see those are the shapes. They're made out of um, galvanized steel tubing and we just like pulled printed vinyl. This is like the master, um, I mean, we like to joke that this is like a construction document. You know, this was the master the master texture map after we took all of those renderings um, of the original ring and projected it over, you know, our, our uh, forms from different directions. This is the texture map we got. Um, and like, these are all the little pieces of um, imagery that we had to somehow get onto those um, signage objects. And so um, this was, Know, the quality of them after we rendered them originally, which was going to be like very low res, right? And um, so what we needed to do after that was take the step of basically photoshopping each one of those images to have higher res, like more authored imagery. So there's a long operation of taking each one of these little, you know, fragments of image um, in that texture map and beginning to add more resolution and detail. Yeah, again, you can see some of the results here. So, low res, high res. Yeah, and if it's not obvious, you know, we were very interested in the way that the, you know, the green of the, um, you know, natural materials rendered would blend in with the green of the actual like, trees and grass on the site. But yeah, you can see here where, you know, just the branches uh, layering into the imagery. Um, but like I mentioned, the like green tinted transparency grid um, kind of reminded us and others of a picnic blanket. Um, so the kind of last operation that we made was a series of what we called stickers. So, you know, taking these occlusion rendered um, objects that one might find in this context and just like, you know, photoshopping them right on to the surfaces, like in their kind of appropriate uh, orientation. So, you know, wine bottles in plan, or, you know, the, the infamous plastic model block chair, you know, in elevation, inside elevation, um, onto the sides of some of the objects here. So, we're at almost an hour now. We've got about five minutes. So I don't know if it's okay to just like talk a little bit about the studio we're teaching. Yeah. So the studio we're teaching is called um, Green Space Screen Space. And it's based on some kind of pedagogical experiments that we've been doing at Michigan and just some of the you know the design work that we've been doing. Um, but really, the, the ambition is to use the techniques of virtual production. You know the way like basically how we use green screens, cameras, lighting prop scenography um, to composite that into digital spaces. You know, this kind of, um, these techniques are ubiquitous now, you know, in television and film production, um, uh, but even like, you know, video game streamers, you know, use this stuff. And so we have this new facility at, at Michigan called the TV Lab, and we've been trying to uh, see what you can do with it and what are the kind of, I don't know, architectural possibilities um, for designing um, between the kind of green space and the screen space. And so this was a, an undergraduate like, seminar, or I guess an undergraduate half semester studio, um, where, where you know, students were asked to basically design the screen space um, of an image, but also design the green space um, in a way that would coordinate movements um, precisely between the space implied um, in the screen space, in the, the physical space, in the green space. So this is like the first exercise we're doing right here in the studio with the, um, the students here in Syracuse. It's kind of like step one to kind of learn about the possibilities. And what, we, what we're ultimately interested in is that it's not a kind of like tidy relationship of like, oh, you make something in green space and you have a screen space, 
and there's a kind of one-to-one -one relationship. But the entire experience of both being in the green space and the screen space at the same time. So it's not that like the image on the wall or the, the space at the, at the green screen, it's like neither one of those are the experience of it. The experience of it is the whole complicated mess of both being in a green space and seeing yourself projected into a screen space and the feedback loop between the two. Um, so, what's that? Yeah, leave it there. All right. Yeah. So this is uh, Isa. I don't know if Isa is there, but this is what has been happening right over here in the studio. So yeah, thank you all for your attention. Thank you both. We have some time for questions if anybody would like to ask one. Thank you so much for the presentation. Um, that's fantastic and I've learned a lot as well as relating to my personal interest. I think I have two questions. Uh, the first one to begin was, so like we talked about, where we have the starting question about what are uh, you guys doing like differently from a traditional design approach and I see um, in the presentation a strong kind of um, tendency to start with something hyper specific like the 3D scan or like the photogrammetry scanning a 3D object and turning that into the digital space and do 3D composition in digital space as well. So it's quite different, for example, as compared to a traditional architecture design by plan and section joints, or even the abstract uh, kind of approach by Bauhaus by composing those like basic geometries. So I think it's a giant leap there, and I like this tendency. It's kind of also tucked into the current digital culture of like uh, responding to um, the logic of composing stuff in like software such as Photoshop, etc. So um, I think there are a lot of opportunities in there. So I just want you to maybe expand on what are the opportunities that this new approach can bring to us to uh, design architecture or like some space. It doesn't need to be architecture, it can be installation, exhibition as well. And then my second question is, I also see there is a kind of aesthetic of ruin or absence that's kind of in your design, meaning um, the exclusion of people you already talked about and also I think the ambiguity of, okay, if the space is in its um, way of becoming it's in construction or it's in its mode of deconstruction, it's kind of um, pointing to that aesthetic ruin or absence. And I just want, uh, maybe you guys can also full, like, elaborate on those a bit more, because I think they're very interesting for me. Thank you. Um, yeah, thanks. It's a great question. I'm sure Adam will have some stuff to say about it. Maybe I'll like start with the ruin and absence part of it. I mean, I think we used to joke that um, we like to collaborate with entropy, you know? And, and I think um, for us, like, the materiality of a building, um, I don't know, like, we, I, I think we always get excited by the ma making clear that materials, the way they're arranged in this building right now, are like a temporary stop along the way, right? Like, if they were in the earth, and they were, you know, whatever, extracted, machined, assembled, and they will someday all fall apart again and be somewhere else. And I think that, you know, thinking of a building that way is, I think, kind of exciting, you know? So, like, anywhere along the way is, like, something that has a lot of, I think, aesthetic possibility. And so, I don't know, yeah, some of the ways that we reveal the way that buildings, like, either being made or coming apart, or maybe not reveal, but almost celebrating it. It's kind of a corny way to put it, but, you know, like, making that something to like frame that as a form of experience or architectural experience rather than you know, like trying to hide it. Um, but I think we also try to not like fetishize it too much, you know? Like I think we're interested in like, you know, we actually like the way it looks. Like, you know, like it's not like we're doing it for a fact or for a gag. Like I think it's like, you know, the like monochrome um, conduit and unistrut and all this stuff. It's like, it looks really good in person. I don't know. Like, yeah, I, I really like the question. Um, thank you. Um, I'll try to speak to the first, since Tom took the second, about abstraction and immediacy. Um, 
I mean, it's funny, in my own teaching, I've been like really teaching more and more about the importance of abstraction. Um, it's a, I think it's the hardest concept to work in. I think it's, it seems even harder for today's students because of the ubiquity of the computer, you know, drawing plans and sections, either literally by hand or constructing them in like a CAD program, like you start to understand architectural design first as an abstract process, right? And I think working in like Rhino, digital space, there's some way in which it seems like it's all already there from the start. <laughs> and teaching students to kind of back up and understand um, how the world is abstract and how architects work through abstraction is incredibly important. I think harder and harder to teach. And it, it's, it's how power moves, it's how capital moves. Like it's really an essential part of, of thinking about the world and, and what we do as architects. Um, I think for us, there's something kind of like what I was saying earlier where, I, I mean in one way, like I want to get people off their phones, you know, like in, into space, but not in a kind of Luddite way or a rejection of the beautiful, immersive world of digital imagery, which is all around us all the time, like it's intoxicating. Um, but what about physical space? What about human experience, like embodied experience? And I think we are trying to figure out ways in which you would move through the world with not like the attention you would have if you just put your phone away, but a new form of attention which cycles these kinds of registers um, and experiences into one another, and pulls you in in, 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 a, in a way. But I think it's at the risk of sounding like self-important. It's almost like don't don't try this at home, <laughs> or like I think we can do it in a way for like those specific reasons, but I'm not saying that every student should design like that in school. Like I think that we're trying to do a very specific thing and there's all sorts of ways of thinking and designing that and education will give you that this is but a narrow bandwidth and certainly not the only way. One, two, three. Uh, I saw your like, like the, theater stuff in the, in the park because I think that's like super cool because like super interactive and I was heard about like people are actually building a render into like the reality world but like in your like this project it kind of gives me a sense that like we already brought the render into reality but we're kind of like bringing it back into the digital world it's like we're not like controlling like the renders in our computer with a mouse but we're just like using like these green objects but it still functions the same as using a mouse and building it in our computer. So I'm just, I'm just thinking if there's like a possibility that we can have that certain projection in reality. Like I'm moving all these green parts and on the other side, like there's like other actual render stuff in reality. Like they're just moving as I move the green parts. I don't think as if it's that's possible or like efficient, but I think, like, I just want to hear your opinions about like how that like double correspond and the reality of work, and how will it mean to like new forms of architecture and new spatial structures? It's a great question. You should have taken our studio. <laughs> That's like what you can do. I mean, I was saying with a living picture, like it is, we create the digital copy of the historical theater, we project it onto the shapes, and then it's kind of done. I mean, there's some level of engagement where you move around trying to like orient yourself in relation to the three projection points. But it's, there's no like mediated, there's no like digital mediation in, in the space, you're just walking around. And I think that that's something that we're exploring, Tom's been exploring through these, his teaching of the green space at, at Michigan in these workshops and modules and then we're doing here. And the idea is that there would be, again, some new form of experience which is a combination. So like we have a site, if we had more time we would talk about the site, it's a new project that we have in Detroit. It's going to be a, an event space that will combine green screen technology, kind of live compositing in an architectural space. And the project will be about designing how all of those things interact with one another. So there will be humans moving through the space in front of, on top of Uber, in front of, behind green objects, non green objects, concrete chunks, and all this stuff. And, and how all of that comes together like is the architectural design project. So we're trying to, I think, articulate a form of experience, which is like what you're describing as like maybe the next step. So I think you're, you're kind of right to ask the question in that way. Yeah, I have some too. 
I mean, I think, um, I don't know, I think it's pretty obvious to say, like, we're all preconditioned. Like, our experience in the material world is, like, preconditioned by the digital images we're constantly consuming, right? Like, um, I think that's pretty uncontroversial to say. So, like, often our first experience of, of architecture is by a digital image, right? And so we're all, like, designers and architects here. So we're constantly making digital images that are supposed to represent, you know, architectural space. So I think that, like, participate, both having your experience preconditioned and participating in the production of those digital images is just, like, the baseline that we kind of start with today, I think. And so I think what we're interested in is, like, okay, that, that's great. Like, what, what are the possibilities in that? I think instead of, like, hand bringing, you know, that, like, yeah, like, you know, what are the possibilities? And now, what if you are live participating in the creation of the digital image while your experience of a space that is, uh, you know, designed to create the digital image is preconditioned by your consumption of digital images? I mean, I think for me, that's great. Like, that just seems like a space to explore. I don't know what the answer is, but I think it's like, I think it's a potential, like, new kind of experience of space um, that doesn't worry too much um, about the, you know, about that preconditioning, but can kind of just, like, revel in it, you know? Like, I'm kind of excited about seeing how people might interact with a space like that. Um, yeah, rather than kind of. Thank you guys so much for this. I'm excited to see what your studio does here. Um, yeah, us too. Yeah. Um, I have maybe a little bit of a productive question. Um, is there a reason that you guys don't use the word collage to reference your process or technique or even the product of your work? Um, it seems like, I mean, I'm just curious if you've talked about it, if it has, I mean, I'm sure it has, but I'm, I'm curious if there's a, a, you know, very conscious reason why you don't mention that. Um, there's a deep interest in association, and that association comes in various different forms, sometimes in abstraction, in rescaling, um, sometimes in, like, more maybe, um, uh, I guess less universal ways, in other words, like some references that maybe only architects, other architects might know. Um, and then you have ones that are very, very universal that almost anybody would be able to kind of identify with. So I'm curious, you know, with the, a lot of your projects, but especially maybe the one, the Venice, the Chicago Biennial, where you do kind of borrow from, you know, fragments from other other people's work, put them in a new context, and they have entirely different associations with, like, you know, the new scenes that you're creating, but they are very much, you know, stitching of fragments of scenes. Um, so I'm just curious how you maybe think about that, whether it's, I'm curious about the collage in particular, uh, and maybe why it, you didn't, you don't use that word, you didn't today, I don't know. Um, but maybe if you can talk a little bit about what fragmentation means to you and why, you know, how you kind of then appropriate them in your own ways um, for experiential reasons, which I think you started to talk about, um, especially with that last project. Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, uh, at least one time, like Andrew Holder, I don't know if you know Andrew Holder, but he, he wrote a piece about collage where he included us and tried to, like, use our work in order to support a a thesis about collage. Um, you know, I think like we've also been accused of using material as ornament. Um, you know, I think like there are different ways uh, that I think you can frame the word. I, like, I'll just be honest. I don't know. I like. I think it's just like not a way that at least I approach thinking about like designing and creating images, especially. But now that I'm saying that out loud, it's almost like maybe it's just so embedded in the way we all work. Maybe it's just like such a baseline approach to image creation these days. Like Photoshop is just the starting point, you know? And like Photoshop is, you can scale anything like frictionlessly, you know? You can, you know, bring in any kind of imagery you want. I mean, maybe Adam, you have more precise thoughts about this, but it's a great question that I don't really have an answer. 
answer to, to be honest. Like, I mean, I think we work in a collage mode, sure, in lots of ways, but I never, like, think about it as collage, I guess. <laughs> like, I never think I'm making a collage, but I don't know. Maybe, yeah. Question. I, we don't, I, don't, I can't recall extensive conversations about it. I think it's a term that was just really dated and felt really dated maybe when we started to work and therefore it wasn't instrumental in our own formation of, of thoughts. But I do think there's something more about layering as both a readily available architectural concept, layering in space, and then also like a native format and formal structure of digital ways of working that is more it can like we're in the the outdoor theater like we're thinking of we're collaging a chair you could say we're collaging a chair into an image image um, but we're also like I think trying to emphasize it as a layer um, I think that when you start I like the idea of the the ghost box project as maybe more of a collage of references and chunks of like buildings which are very specific and have affiliations. Um, but I think for, I don't know, I think when it gets spatial it starts to become more, like we use the word sonography a bunch and like trying to think about what's an architectural sonography and for us it's like not just prioritizing one vantage point but again like thinking about the backside of sonography or seeing sonography from the side. Um, so it becomes kind of more spatialized. Um, I don't think, yeah, so those are, we, that's maybe as close as we can get. It's not a super conscious thing that we're like, collage is bad. I think it's just not a term that we use to process our work on it much, but maybe we should. Yeah, that's a great question. It's not that we dislike collage. There's no the conscious decision to not think about it as collage, but yeah, I think we probably just Thank you. This is, um, it's really exciting to see what's happening in your studio, and I hover over like student screen all the time. It looks really cool. Uh, I have a quick or like a more specific question related to Iman's question. Um, I kind of wonder like how the photogrammetric scan of objects inform your design, and if the authenticity of it is more important or the like intentional misreading of it. Um, and what do you think the printing um, them out as fabric um, add to the project, to the space? Thank you. So, um, I think we've, we've, all four of us have thought about it <laughs> at length. Uh, Ellie and I have written about it quite a bit, photogrammetry as a way of thinking about what we call post-digital materiality. Um, we don't talk about post-digital. <laughs> I don't know, it's post, Hans is post-digital, it's kind of old, right? It's, it's already over, it's hard to keep track of like timeline. Of, yeah. Um, but for us to say that like post-digital is an idea that the digital, like digital characteristics are no longer uh, isolated or only in digital objects, that they're diffuse and they're sort of just part of aesthetic culture and language generally. And we use photogrammetry as a, as a as a case to think through this idea, um, moving away from the, let's say if you photo, we wrote about a rock, so if you do photogrammetry of a rock, you could think of the rock as the original and the photogrammetry scan as the copy, but what we say in the paper is like, actually it just gives you this broader range of ways to work on the rock, so you, what photogrammetry does is it gives you a polygon model and a texture map, so all of a sudden you have a, like a shape and you have an image and you can manipulate or engage both. And that's an expanded realm of materiality that we can now think about, I think just beyond the terms of like authentic and fake or real, like I actually don't, I don't, you, I try not to use the word real, like virtual and real, like I think what's, I think it's all real, right? One's, I try to say physical and digital more. Um, so I think it's, yeah, it just sort of represents more of an expanded area for design. I don't have a ton of it, but I would say like just the, the texture map and the mesh, it's not that you can just like work on them individually, it's just like now you've taken apart like the form and it's, you know, the, the image that gets mapped to its surface and they don't need to map on one another anymore, they're, they're, own, they're their own artifact at that point. 
We'll take one more question from Professor Linder before we close out. The professor. Um, thank you. That, that's obligatory these days, I guess, you have to say thank you at the end of the lecture. Um, I, I really liked where you ended up talking about the studio, because it seemed to me that that's what I was thinking about your work as you were going through it, that it's operating in this kind of um, intermedia, heterogeneous melange of assembled very different abstractions. And I, and I also was happy that Adam, at the end, you came back to abstraction, because at the beginning you said something about you were resisting abstraction, but, but I don't think that's true at all. Um, and I just wanted to put in one little thing. I, I think why they don't talk about collage is because it has nothing to do with collage. I, I think there's little uh, vestigial signifiers that we see and we go, oh, that's collage, that's assembled fragments. You know, I see little Michael Graves things or um, things that remind me of paste ups and, you know, primitive Photoshop and stuff. But, but you know, yeah, I don't, you know, I think, I think it, you know, in the kind of movement from collage to montage to assemblage to whatever intermediate is, you know, you're really much more contemporary in that way. Um, there was one point, just to get to the question, um, where I can't remember, I think Tom, you said the renderings don't do the materials justice. When you're talking about the project uh, in Detroit, um, and, I, and then with the project in Wisconsin. You caught me. All right, you caught me. Well, no, I, I thought that was that was great. And then with the Wisconsin project, I thought it was the opposite that the materials weren't doing the rendering justice. But it seems to me that's where the problem, you know, your work resides is in that problem. So when you're talking about things like the aestheticization of construction, um, you know, we start to wonder, well, what do you mean aesthetic? You know, what, what is aesthetics in this situation? You know, what are you drawing on to explain what aesthetics might be? And, and then there's the question of what, what doing justice is. You know, how could you do justice? You know, what, what, what's just, what's fair, what's right? But, you know, so there's like, there's a kind of deep speculation in the work, all of it. You know, which is really what my question was about. You know, I, I, I would just want you to not, and then you can respond. Um, you know, to say that you're not as spec, your work isn't as speculative as it used to be. It seems to me it's just as speculative. You know, that I don't see why buildings or making things or professional practice should be any less speculative than you know the projects you do when you're 25 years old. Um, I wonder what, you know, what, what do you, do you disagree with that? Do you think you're just as speculative now? Is it still a speculative practice? Yeah, well it makes me, it makes me want to ask you what, what you mean by speculative? <laughs> you mean just speculating on possibility, you know, like, like, like imagining? Uh, Imaginative, uh, experimental, uh, non-standard, um, doing things, not worrying too much about a predetermined outcome, you know, hoping to open up other kind of spaces for new audiences, new kinds of practices. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, no, I think, I think you're right. Yeah, maybe, maybe it's more in the mechanics of how our careers have gone, but maybe it's a better way to think about it. It's like getting clients is a different effort than uh, pitching to biennials, you know? And, and so I, I, think, I think there are different ways to frame things, right? I think our commitments and our interests are the same. Um, but I think it's, yeah, the way we have to like frame our work and our practice and what we're trying to achieve. But I think like, yeah, intellectually, creatively, you know, we're still, we're trying to do the same thing. You know, I guess, I guess that's, that's, the, that's the goal, right? It's like, you don't go from, doing wild, whatever, representation experiments, and then suddenly you get your first project and it's like a dwell house, you know? And I think, like, that can happen. I think we've seen, you know, people whose careers have gone that way. And we've been really trying to 
yeah, keep that kind of whatever you want to call it, speculation for open-endedness, like, in the work, and we've been, I mean, we should just also acknowledge, like, we have full-time academic jobs, so we can, like, say no to clients, so like, we can just, like, be very choosy about clients who are going to be excited about the open-endedness of a project rather than, um, you know, just wanting something to come in on budget, <laughs> so, I mean, it's a great question, yeah, I'm sure it has some thoughts. Yeah, I appreciate it, thanks, Mark. I mean, I, in one way, it's just, like, I appreciate the opportunity to refine language. I mean, I'm always talking to my students about like, if I use a word that you don't understand, just like stop me and ask me what that word means, because I think um, we do our students a disservice if we use fancy words that don't make sense to them. Um, so maybe it's just like built and unbuilt is a better like binary to throw out there as opposed to like speculative and um, real, I guess. I think we also just wanted to use IRL. Um, but I think that, um, you know, in some ways it's also just about trying to present um, the opportunities that were afforded to us as academics. So we worked for offices for a few years and then we started teaching. We get funding from our university to do projects at like a certain scale. And then we teach about them and we write about them so we develop ideas. And then we get to think really imaginatively about what architecture can be. And there's nothing special about that. Like, I think we have a lot of privilege involved with that. We feel really fortunate to have those opportunities. And I think part of the point in just laying it out for the students is it's like, these are ideas that come from the space that you all occupy about, like, what can architecture be? It can kind of be anything in school. And then trying to, like, work on those ideas, develop them, and then when you have an opportunity to, to build, how can you kind of keep those ideas present? And yeah, so maybe that proves your point, like the speculation, or sort of like continue to try to speculate on the ideas that just came through the projects that were more about representation, drawings and models, and now we're trying to um, materialize them in the physical world. Um, and there's a commitment and probably a continuity there, so. Thanks, though. Uh, thank you all for coming tonight. Let's conclude by thanking Adam and Tom for their presentation.